jury will not be sequestered. I'm Brian Buckmar along with Terry Austin. In the Weinstein case, fellow silence breakers and any selection is moving along here. We'll now read the verdicts as in Jesse Weber. Thanks for joining us. We tend to see it as raw as this. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the afternoon session. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be taking it until 5 o'clock. We have a few topics we'll be talking about on the show. Of course, we continue to recap the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard defamation trial. Obviously, a very fascinating case that's still captivating a nation. In other celebrity news, Mariah Carey is being sued for her hit, All I Want for Christmas is You. Can you believe it? It's an old song, but she is now in legal trouble, at least Jeopardy, with regard to that. Also, there's a new development in the Ryan Duke case, the case that just keeps on going. Uh, with that, we covered gavel to gavel on the Law and Crime Network. He was acquitted uh, for the murder in Georgia of beauty queen Tara Grinstead, but now he is facing additional charges, concealment charges, in particular in the county where he said he helped Bo Dukes burn Grinstead's body. Uh, we will bring you two new trials this week as well, so hang on to your seat. Jury selection's underway in Orange County, Florida, in the trial of Danielle Redlick. Uh, she is accused, uh, charged with second-degree murder with a weapon and tampering with physical evidence in the 2019 death of her husband, Michael Redlick. Uh, Redlick called 911 and said that her husband had a heart attack, but when EMS responded to the scene, she indicated that he stabbed himself. The coroner is saying, they had after an altercation, the coroner is saying that these are not self-inflicted stab wounds, so that's going to be an interesting uh, case to see whether or not she will be able to prove that these were self-inflicted or if the government could prove rather that they are not. And in Jacksonville, Florida, jury selection is also underway in the penalty phase retrial of Alan Wade and Michael Jackson. You may remember this case. Both defendants were previously convicted of first-degree murder, kidnapping and robbery of James and Carol Sumner. Uh, they have to be retrialed because of these, uh, sorry, this trial, they were buried alive back in 2005. Uh, they were both sentenced to death for that horrible and horrific crime. However, it was thrown out after the state legislator, legislature changed a law in 2017 that requires a unanimous jury verdict uh, before you can impose the death penalty. So that will be a sentencing phase only. So anyway, let's get back to Johnny Depp because that obviously is the defamation trial of the century and has a lot of uh, blowback going on from so many different sectors uh, after this verdict came back last week. Here is what each side was awarded. Heard was awarded for damages on Adam Waldman's second long statement when he claimed incidents uh, of the May 2016 penthouse incident were staged. Um, and so let's get back to that with respect to this trial and the verdict that came in, obviously very compelling. So let's take a look at the verdict. As against Amber Heard, we, the jury, award compensatory damages in the amount of $10 million. As against Amber Heard, we, the jury, award punitive damages in the amount of $5 million. Three, as to this statement appearing in the April 27, 2020, online edition of the Daily Mail, quote, we've reached the beginning of the end of Ms. Heard's abuse hoax against Johnny Depp, end quote. Do you find that Ms. Heard has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, no. As against John C. Depp II, we, the jury, award compensatory damages in the amount of $2 million. As against John C. Depp II, we, the jury, award punitive damages in the amount of $0. Obviously, the community debating whether or not this verdict is uh, something that's positive or not with respect to domestic violence cases. Uh, I find this uh, kind of commentary very interesting. We'll certainly get that into that with our great guests that we're going to have here. Interestingly enough, the Washington Post added an editor's note to the top of the Amber Heard's op-ed that reads as follows. In January 2019, Depp sued Amber Heard for defamation arising out of a 2018 op-ed on June 1st. 2022, following a trial in Fairfax County, Virginia, circuit court uh, found a jury found her liable on three counts. The following statements, which Depp claimed were false and defamatory: I spoke up against the sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. 
That has to change. Then two years ago, I was a public figure representing domestic abuse, and I felt the full, full force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out. I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men of, uh, of accused of abuse. The jury separately found that Depp through his lawyer, Adam Waldman, defamed Heard in one of her three counts in the counter lawsuit. So uh, that's pretty much uh, what we got right now. Let me uh, introduce our guest uh, that we have. Uh, Mitra Ahorian is an entertainment attorney. Uh, Mitra, welcome back to the show. I. I think this is, uh, a lot of people are saying that this case is only about the celebrity of it. Of course, there's that element to it, but there's also messaging that's going on from both camps. Interestingly enough, Amber Heard's camp is doubling down on these statements, which I find, at least from a legal point of view, perhaps very dangerous, especially given the fact that a jury came back with a verdict that clearly established they did not believe Amber Heard, because even a single instance of domestic abuse, even a single one that they believed would have made her statements true with regard to uh, the defamation case, and if there was a single instance of sexual assault, it would have made it true, but they came out right out giving all damages on all three counts of Johnny Depp, which by definition means they did not believe Amber Heard's story. So one is an entertainment specialist. Do you find it odd that they're doubling down on these statements, potentially creating more of a slander suit? And where are you falling on this thing where people are saying this was a setback uh, for the Me Too movement and women in particular in domestic violence, could it be argued that perhaps it's a setback when people come into court and don't tell the truth and accuse somebody of something they didn't do? Yeah, I'll take that second one first. Um, I, I disagree that it's a setback. I actually think that it opened up a conversation that needed to be had, and that is the weaponizing of the threat of sexual abuse or the threat of physical abuse, um, which tends to happen. And, and I think that that's something that with the Me Too movement, we sort of shut a blind eye to in order to make, make up for the fact that we weren't always believing women. So maybe the pendulum is now swinging back to have a more honest and real conversation about how these things actually happen. And they're quite complicated. They're not always you know, a Harvey Weinstein situation, sometimes they come up in the context of a relationship. And that's when things get really complicated with the psychology of, of you know, how two people find one another. So I think that, uh, I, I don't think it's a setback. I think anything that opens up honest discourse is always a good thing. And you'll have to remind me of that second question. Yeah, well, let, let me drill down on that one. I mean, Mitra, this is the, look, as a prosecutor that prosecuted domestic violence cases, domestic violence homicides that ultimately turned into murder cases, I mean, we all know in the business uh, there are times that people make false complaints, uh, whether or not it's because they're trying to get a tactical advantage in a divorce or a custody battle, uh, or they're, they're agitated for whatever reason, and maybe even some of them believing it, but the objective evidence that comes out during the case just does not support it. And we've had many people who have recanted their domestic violence allegation after we as prosecutors developed information, initially pursuing them as a victim, saying, wait, this doesn't make any sense, it's contradictory to the information you gave us. And they say, well, I, I, I made it up because, you know, I was mad, I was angry. The thing that bothers me as a trial lawyer is that, look, we cover this gavel to gavel here on this network, and, and not that the court of public opinion means anything in terms of, uh, you know, these devices here and, and what people are saying, but many of the legal analysts and many of the hosts of the show saw that Amber Heard's credibility was significantly, significantly impaired, and we were not in that jury box watching the demeanor of the witnesses and the manner in which they were. So I kind of find it offensive when people say it's a, it's an insult to domestic violence abuse victims. We don't want that, of course. But the fact is the jury didn't believe it. And where are we getting in a society when we no longer accept that people can have a contrary view than yours with regard to what the facts are? Don't facts matter anymore? I'll say this. Um, one of the things that I was wondering the entire time that we were watching this trial sort of on the outside, quote unquote, even though we had the cameras in the courtroom, there's something different to being in that physical space. And of course, we don't see all of the reactions and we did not see the jury to see how they were reacting. And, you know, one of the questions that's coming up, even coming up on this appeal is how much did we experience that is different from what the jury may have experienced? And that was a question I had all along. 
And so it's really interesting to see that, you know, perhaps human beings have this sort of instinctual or innate ability to pick up on when someone is lying, regardless of what is being presented to them and perhaps the influence of being in that environment, which is different from what we're seeing on the screen, because we're, of course, you know, a lot of people are seeing bits and pieces of it. They're not seeing the entire thing. And there's also this tidal wave of people who are overwhelmingly uh, calling Amber Heard a liar um, that presumably we have to assume the jury did not see these things. So at the end of the day, like you said, it comes down to her credibility. It was not a hard task for her defense to show that there was one instance of abuse. I think anyone watching could probably argue that perhaps there was one instance there. We could probably find something, maybe not in the stories that were told. Um, but in some form, you know, Johnny Depp acknowledged that it could be a psychological, emotional, other types of abuse. So not a hard task. So at the end of the day, like you said, it was a rejection of her entire statement. And if you can't believe someone, how do you know what parts to believe and what parts you can't believe? Yeah, I, I just think in a country, I don't know, we've become so politicized with our legal debates. You know, we're in the courtroom, and we know darn well when we have high-profile cases that are reported on that despite even how much the reporter wants to do the right thing, the feel in the courtroom is much different than what actually gets out into the public, even when you have a camera inside that courtroom. I've had it occur myself. Uh, but nevertheless, the bottom line is facts should matter. I don't think it sets me too back at all. Uh, we should certainly aggressively handle those cases. Cases, but when the facts don't support it, uh, there, there should be findings such as this. And then we let juries decide that that's what happens everywhere. It's almost like saying, well, if you're a criminal defendant and you're found not guilty, the whole system's falling apart. Everyone should be found guilty that's been charged with a crime. Anyway, I won't go on my soapbox much longer about that. Let's look a little bit at the Johnny Depp closing arguments and see where they fit in in terms of what ultimately the jury did. Mr. Depp wasn't canceled by Hollywood because he was sometimes late to set. He was canceled because Ms. Heard falsely accused him of domestic violence and sexual violence on the pages of the Washington Post on December 18, 2018, repeating the prior lies of May 17, 2016. And as you saw at trial, Ms. Heard published the op-ed on December 18, 2018, two years after her public allegations of domestic abuse. Ms. Heard's publication of the op-ed coincided with the release of her major movie, Aquaman, that December. And it coincided as well with her announcement on Twitter that she was becoming an ACLU ambassador for women's rights. And in that op-ed, Ms. Heard repeated her false allegations against Mr. Depp. Now, she didn't mention his name. She didn't have to. Everyone knew exactly who and what Ms. Heard was talking about. Ms. Heard got on the stand and tried to tell you that the op-ed was not about Mr. Depp. She then said, well, it wasn't just about Mr. Depp. But she couldn't deny, and this was yesterday, that this was at least partly about Mr. Depp. The op-ed obviously is about Mr. Depp, and the testimony at trial proves that. You will recall testimony from the ACLU's representative, an attorney, stating that Mr. Depp's name was included in drafts of the op-ed, and that they and others understood that the op-ed was about Mr. Depp. Specifically, the ACLU representative testified, among other things, quote, Based on my review of prior drafts of the op-ed, I knew that they were, that she was referring to Johnny Depp and the marriage, unquote. Ms. Hurd's claim that the op-ed is not about Mr. Depp is just another one of her many, many lies. In fact, what you have seen time and time again through the course of this trial is that Ms. Hurd lies. She lies all the time about things that are important and the things that aren't important, she just can't seem to stop. And as Ms. Vasquez said, what she routinely does is she doesn't take ownership or responsibility for anything, and she has an excuse for everything. But in this courtroom, confronted with the evidence, she can't run away 
from her own words. As my colleague said, words matter, and Ms. Hurd is condemned by her own words. Okay, part of the closing argument, I also have Adam Conta with me, criminal defense lawyer. Adam, uh, talk to our audience about the importance of your credibility as a lawyer when you are making arguments and opening statements, and do you think that the credibility not only of Amber Heard but her legal team, because it's one in one A when you're in that courtroom, was impaired or damaged when there was the argument that, well, I can't even prove it was about Johnny Depp, and yet all this avalanche of evidence came through, including out of the mouth of Amber Heard on the witness stand, that it was about Johnny Depp. How does that have an effect on a jury's decision? Yeah, of course it does. Credibility is king, right? And so, uh, for instance, like I don't do opening statements a lot. If I can get out what I need to get out in front of a voir dire, in front of jury selection, then I might choose not to do a, a, an opening statement at all because it's not my burden to prove anything. It's the prosecutors. And in a situation like this, point being is that you're, you're promising you're promising to a jury when you give an opening statement. So you need to deliver on those promises. Now, if you're going to make as part of your promise, hey, she was she's the victim here, but she never said that it was him specifically, you can't prove it was him, then you're losing credibility by omission. You're telling something that the jury knows already is patently true, and you're trying to kind of play both sides. You can't do that. Even if you technically can, you're going to blow your credibility in the process. So your opening statement is so important because you're building that relationship with the jury, what you've already tried to build on while selecting the jury. So this is the first time you really have to really give a full-throated uh, uh, speech to the jury and really lay out everything you want to do and everything you uh, intend to prove and anything you intend not to have proven. Uh, and so it was a big hit, I think, when you start out by such a critical element and you're kind of being cagey about it, because that's how it comes off. It comes off as cagey, and that's not a word you want associated with yourself as a lawyer. Yeah, no, no question about it, Adam. Okay, guys, appreciate the commentary. We're going to take a quick break because we got a lot to cover here at the Law Crime Network. Stay with us. We'll be right back. It's important to surround yourself with the right people. I've got my workout squad, my brunch squad, and my favorite, my saving squad. They find me the best deals, so I'm not stuck paying for anything that I don't have to. That's why I'm all about CarShield. If your car is out of warranty, you've got to call CarShield today. Because when your car breaks down, you're the one left holding the bill. CarShield administrators help get those repairs paid. That's straight up savings on car repairs. So pick up the phone and call CarShield before your car breaks breaks down. Darlings, this is very important. Call before your car breaks down. Let's keep it real. We rely on mechanics with extensive knowledge and experience to fix our cars. I trust CarShield with my baby, and you should too. CarShield has plans that include protection on major parts and systems like the engine, transmission, entertainment system, air conditioning, electronics, and more. CarShield administrators go the extra mile by including car rental options. You also get emergency services for flat or damaged tires, lockouts, dead batteries, and courtesy towing, all at no additional cost to you. That means the price you pay today is the price you'll pay for as long as you cover your car. Darlings, saving on expensive car repairs is just a phone call away. For me, it's a no-brainer. CarShield is America's best value. Join my saving squad and call CarShield so a real protection expert can help you save on car repairs. You need to call CarShield. Matter of fact, you need to call right now. Protect yourself from the unprecedented rise in costs for parts and repairs. Call now to save money with your price lock guarantees at 800-467-6521. 800-467-6521. 800-467-6521. Attention Medicare recipients. The Enogen One Portable Oxygen Concentrator may now be available at little or no cost to you. Call 800-418-9366 to order yours today. Indigen oxygen concentrators are portable and make oxygen from the air around you. They're light, quiet, and battery operated to go everywhere you go. 
And we have a full line of portable oxygen units to fit a wide range of budgets. If you're on Medicare, you may even qualify to get your Energen unit at little or no cost to you. Go back to joining friends for the breakfast special, make spending time with the grandkids easier, or start attending your religious services again. Call Energen now for a free information kit and a free no-obligation consultation on our complete line of affordable portable oxygen products. And anyone on Medicare or with eligible insurance plans may qualify to get an Energen One at little or no cost. Call 800-418-9366. That's 800-418-9366. I'm Dan Abrams, and you're watching Law & Crime. Welcome back to the afternoon session. Just about two weeks ago, Ryan Duke was found not guilty on all counts in the murder of Georgia beauty queen Tara Grinstead, except the sixth count concealing her death. He was sentenced to the maximum 10 years in jail for that final count, and he's eligible for parole due to five years already being served in prison. Now, he's been indicted in Ben Hill County, where the pecan or Orchard, where they said they had helped to burn uh, Greenstead's remains, is located. He is facing similar concealment charges that Bo Dukes faced that landed him 25 years in prison. Uh, so this is really uh, an amazing case. And, you know, Ryan Duke actually took the witness stand in his trial where he was acquitted. So it's a bold move. And keep in mind, with Ryan Duke, he had given a confession to police so the defense attorneys had to kind of work around saying that that was a false confession. Let's take a, list, a little listen to Ryan Duke on the witness stand. Mr. Duke, did you murder Tara Grinstead? I did not. Did you break into her home on October 22nd or 23rd, 2005? No, sure, I did not. Have you ever been inside her home at any point in your life? No, sure, I have Did you ever have a sexual relationship with Ms. Grinstead? I did not. Did you ever strike Ms. Greenstead? No, sir, I did not. Did you ever choke Ms. Greenstead? No, sir, I never choked anyone. Have you ever been inside Ms. Greenstead's car? No, sir, I have not. Did you ever take a pair of gloves or a glove to Ms. Greenstead's home? No, sir, I did not. Did you see Ms. Greenstead's body after she died? I did. Where did you see it? In the pecan orchard. Did somebody take you to the body? They did. Who took you to the body? Bo Dukes. Did Bo Dukes tell you that he killed Tara Grinstead? He did. Do you know how Ms. Grinstead died? I do not. Were you asked to help dispose of her body? I was. Who asked you to do that? Bo Dukes. Did you help Bo Dukes move Ms. Greenstead's body in the orchard? I did. Were you afraid that he'd hurt you or your family if you told anyone about it? I was. Is that why you didn't come forward prior to February of 2017? Yes, sir. Okay, so acquitted of the murder, that's the big charge. Family very upset, and they're happy that there's been another indictment, hoping that there can be convictions for some of these other offenses that they can tack on to the sentence that he's currently serving. He's currently facing the following new charges, concealing the death of another, hindering the apprehension or punishment of a criminal, concealment of facts, two counts, tampering with evidence, two counts, Bo Dukes, uh, who's obviously also involved in all this, each pointing the finger at the other. Bo Dukes' second trial for similar charges, uh, he's already serving time in jail for that. So let's take a look uh, back at Ashley, uh, but he's got an open indictment as well. Let's take a look back at Ashley Merchant's closing argument uh, that gave R Ryan Duke the actual acquittal, if you will, in terms of some of the questions that she was asking in his first trial, asking, has the state been able to answer these questions? for you may have been a powerful moment. Lawyers like to be able to sum up based upon the failure of the prosecution to fill in blanks. Let's take a listen. I've written out in my terrible handwriting <laughs> some questions that I challenge the state to get up here and answer for you because you deserve to have an answer to these questions. How does the glove corroborate how Ms. Grinstead died? Cause of death. Something they have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. How does the glove corroborate that Ryan 
caused her death. I asked Agent Chanel these questions, and he said it doesn't. He said there's no evidence of this. How does a glove corroborate that she died in Irwin County? A glove that did not appear until Monday morning. How does the call corroborate, this, this 411 call? How does it corroborate the cause of death? Remember, the law says his statement has to be corroborated. So they want you to believe that that one statement is the statement that is the holy grail, and they have to corroborate it. How does that call corroborate that Ryan is the one that killed Ms. Grinstead? How does it corroborate that she actually even died in Irwin County? What proof beyond a reasonable doubt has the state brought you to prove Ryan's statement to Agent Chadell was accurate? Because everything you heard from the witness stand was that it was not, that it was a mess. It was all over the place. What evidence has the state brought you to disprove Ryan's sworn testimony in front of you beyond a reasonable doubt? They have to do all this. They have to answer all these questions. And again, I don't get to get back up here. So I, I, I leave these questions and challenge the state to try and answer these questions because Everybody deserves, they're, they're asking you to convict a man of murder, and they can't answer these questions. And the law requires that. Uh, well, Mitra, we, we know the uh, end analysis here. He was acquitted of that murder. Some people are in complete shock based on the evidence that came out in the case. And of course, like I indicated before, he gave a statement, uh, the police arguing and the prosecutors arguing, he gave information confessing to things that weren't out in the public, things that only the murderer could know. But nevertheless, he was acquitted. What did you think of the defense attorney's uh, closing argument and any insights you have into why the jury may have acquitted him on that charge? Yeah, that was very interesting to me. Um, you know, with respect to the defense, I think that, you know, highlighting the fact that there wasn't a corroboration and also highlighting the fact that the uh, burden was on the prosecutor, I think those were strong. But whether the entire um, the entire closing was strong enough, I mean, clearly, no. Um, as far as this particular, sorry, as far as the um, uh, not being, char not being uh, convicted of murder, on the initial case that was in um, Irwin County, I mean, I think that was one that, like you said, the family was very disappointed of, and, and I, I'm glad that they're having a second chance at this um, at, at to potentially add more years to that sentence. Adam. Uh, something else that she had mentioned in her closing arguments that I thought was interesting and as a homicide prosecutor used to kind of unnerve me when I had these cases is that there really wasn't an establishment of the the cause and manner of death beyond a reasonable doubt. The, the lawyer argued that, but she also argued an interesting jurisdictional question. Did they prove to you it happened within this county? And you must believe find that beyond the reasonable doubt. And I've had a couple of trials where there was some confusion as to whether the murder may have been in our county or in another county do you think that it could be something technically like that where they were like we're just not convinced where it occurred but we believe he did it is that possible it's possible but you know i think we should give more credit to the job done here there were holes that were significantly punched and at the end of the trial those holes remained this isn't the you know the, our system is not prove every possible you, you know if you think he did it then he's guilty. It's proved beyond a reasonable doubt. So yeah, there was a confession. There was evidence that wasn't known to the public. Could he have learned that from someone else? Maybe. But there were big holes that remained at the end. And so if you highlight those big holes, even if you've gotten 75% of the way there, if you've got 25% that's just up in the air, that's reasonable doubt, right? So the jury did what it's supposed to do. You know, I disagree that uh, there's now this new bite at the apple and that they could add more time, and that's a good thing. I mean, this to me smacks of double jeopardy, mm. and I have still yet to see why there are there is new laws and new evidence that would require this is the, the, that they go back to trial in a different county. This is sour grapes to me. You're going to get ten years out of a concealment of a body. That's a pretty hefty sentence for what he's accused of. If you think he did more than that, then get in a courtroom and prove it. And you couldn't do that. You thought you had everything you needed. You went in there with the confession and thought that was it. You didn't. You weren't prepared to to adjust and and really prosecute the case to the point where you're beyond a reasonable doubt. And now you want more time added on. To me, I, I don't I don't like the way this smells. I don't the way like the way it looks. And I haven't seen any evidence as of yet that would tell me why this is so 
such new and important evidence that it would uh, that it would yield a new trial. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I was thinking the very first thing that hit me about that double jeopardy argument, I think a lot of people don't really understand what that is. So hopefully we'll get an opportunity to talk about what it means, not just in concept, but how it how it actually plays out in practice. And last point I'd like to bring out, the, the defense lawyer is saying that it's just a confession that wasn't corroborated. In most states, a mere confession alone is not enough to convict. There has to be an additional evidence just how ever slight, and that's why the lawyer was saying it was just a confession without any other evidence. Great commentary, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, but we don't go anywhere. We're going to take a break, but we're going to be back to Johnny Depp for some more of the more fascinating aspects of this case and actually some new developments that have occurred since the trial. Stay with us. I'm Dan Abrams, and you're watching Law & Crime. Hi, folks. Medicare Part C plans with extra benefits like getting money added back to your Social Security check may now be available to you in your zip code. Make sure you're not missing out. It's simple. One, call the number on your screen. Two, they'll look up your zip code and see if you're eligible. Three, they'll check for plans with extra benefits like prescriptions, dental coverage, and the benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every single month. Call now. I called to get everything I deserve. I called to check my zip code for a plan with a benefit that adds money back to my Social Security check. I called to check my zip code. Millions of people have called the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Call, check your zip code, see if you're eligible, and get what you deserve. Call now. Call 1-800-256-1761. That's 1-800-256-1761 now. Guys. If you're suffering from erectile dysfunction, Peak Performance for Men has a natural solution that can help you today. That's right. Stop wasting money on pills and inferior technology that hurts and just masks your ED. Fix it for good. The best part, our ED treatment is non-invasive, painless, and you can get back to your natural function after just a few short in-office sessions. Call us today and mention this ad and your initial consultation is free. We are your trusted specialist and only national erectile dysfunction provider. Call Peak Performance for Men today. Each year, Americans waste $21 billion by overpaying on car insurance. That's why I went to TheZebra.com. Because while every company claims to save you money on car insurance, The Zebra shows you who actually can. Compare car insurance for free at TheZebra.com today. I'm Dr. Lakeisha Simmons. Four years ago, I was a single mom, and I was living paycheck to paycheck. That's when I downloaded the free personal capital app, and it changed my financial future. I linked all of my accounts, and I instantly saw where I stood. I was able to track my budgets and spending and see how that affected my net worth. Now I use the retirement planner and I monitor my entire portfolio. Four years later, my nest egg has grown and I'm ready to retire. Download the free app or go to personalcapital.com today. gone wild over bucket hats. How do you improve on the must-have headwear everybody wants? With breakthrough cooling technology. Mission is the leader in cooling and heat relief innovations, now engineered into a full line of stylish and versatile bucket hats. The coolest hat you'll ever wear. On the outside, UPF 50 performance fabrics. On the inside, our exclusive hydroactive cooling technology, now with 50% more cooling power. Activate with water, ring, and wave for cooling up to 30 degrees below your body temperature in under a minute. It's like your own climate control that goes where you go. Conquering the great outdoors, looking fabulous by the pool, or even better on the town. Hard at work or hard at play. No matter how hot it gets, cool more. Do more with Mission. Machine washable, chemical-free cooling that lasts for hours. Go to Mission.com right now to get your own cooling bucket hat starting as low as $19.99. For a limited time, use the promo code below to save 25% and get free shipping on all Mission cooling and heat relief innovations. I love Simplify by Quicken. It shows me how much I'm spending and creates a personalized spending plan. I always know how much I can spend and save. How much more could you save? Take the Simplify Challenge and find out. Name the best budgeting app by the New York Times Wirecutter. Start your free trial today.
right, welcome back to the afternoon session. My name is Bob Bianchi. If you take it to five o'clock, so we're going to be peppering in the uh, Johnny Depp Amber Heard case. Uh, one of the things, trial tactically, that's very, very difficult for lawyers to make a decision, you know, you got to kind of go on feel the case, is the rebuttal cases. And in this particular instance, the jury got to listen to each uh, Ms. Heard and Mr. Depp a second time. And some actually, some of the most emotional testimony that came out during those rebuttals, interestingly. Let's take a listen to a little bit of Johnny Depp on rebuttal. Mr. Depp, what has it been like for you to listen to Ms. Hurd's testimony at this trial? I'm sorry? What has it been like for you to listen to Ms. Hurd's testimony at this trial? Objection relevance, Your Honor. Oh, overruled. Insane. It's, it's insane to hear heinous um, accusations of violence, sexual violence, that she's attributed to me, that she's accused me of. Um, I don't think anyone enjoys having to uh, split themselves open and tell the truth. But um, there are times when one just simply has to because it's gotten out of control. It horrible. Um, Ridiculous, humiliating, ludicrous, painful, savage, un, unimaginably brutal, cruel, um, and all false. No human being is perfect, certainly not. None of us. But I have never in my life committed sexual battery, physical abuse, all these outlandish, outrageous stories of me committing these things. and living with it for six years and waiting to be able to bring the truth out. So this is not uh, easy for any of us. I know that. But um, uh, no matter what happens, I did get here and I did tell the truth and I have spoken up for what I've been carrying on my back reluctantly for six years. Adam, I want to go to you on this question about uh, criminal law. He, she accused him of some pretty violent sexual offenses that, if a prosecutor were to believe it, uh, could land him, I'd imagine, in jail for a considerable period of time because all state laws, uh, certainly in Jersey and, and New York and I can, I'm sure everywhere else. So whenever you have a client who faces potentially within the statute of limitations a possible charge by prosecutors, most defense lawyers try to stay away from civil courts where you, especially if you bring the case, then you have interrogatories you have to answer, depositions that you have to answer, courtroom testimony that you have to answer to, and a slip of the tongue or a slip of the lip could cause you to wind up in some serious criminal law jeopardy. Talk to me about what you think that conversation looked like amongst these attorneys and um, 
does, does that in your mind weigh into that he really believed in his cause and brought this forward for that, partially for that reason? Oh, boy. Does it weigh into my thinking that he, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Because here's the thing. Let's keep in mind, this is not the first trial, right? Mm -hmm. This is his second bite at the apple. He lost in the UK, where the UK said essentially, no, we think you beat her up 12 times. Uh, and so to come now into this arena, I think the the once you put something into motion that's this big, it's hard to undo it, right? So I guarantee you to your question that somebody along the way, he had a team of people along the way that said, hey, if you go down this path, if there's any real substantial proof of the sexual violence, let alone just the domestic violence, this could create a legal mess for you criminally. Uh, but you look at these people, you hear the testimony, and I know this isn't what you asked, but I mean, do you, would, would you take these people on as a prosecutor? You're a former prosecutor. You got people, these are, these. what I took away from this trial, these are two people that I wouldn't want any of my kids being in a relationship with. These are people who treated yeah. them each other very poorly and uh, and put themselves in really bad, bad positions. I think yeah. both of them were not telling the truth. So if you don't think they're telling the truth, you don't want to prosecute that case, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, but that's we only found out about that after the trial had occurred and we listened to the testimony. I'd be more worried about Johnny Depp's making a statement or saying something that may, you know, Dot and I are cross a T for prosecutors, but uh, nevertheless, they made it through. Mitra, let me ask, uh, of some that I find very interesting about Depp's testimony and from a clip that we watched before is he was on the stand and took responsibility for his actions. He was He's actually self-deprecating in many sense about his drug use. And he even said that this is not easy for any of us, kind of alluding to, you know, Amber Heard as well, where there have been an argument that Amber Heard took no responsibility for anything, even though those tapes clearly show there was a mutual, at least at a minimum, combative uh, domestic violence, domestic situation going on between them. Do you think that that affected the jury to see the demure, uh, willing to accept responsibility, and almost even saying it's not easy for any of us, Johnny Depp, versus the Amber Heard stoic, I'll look directly at the jury, not move my attention from them, not accept any responsibility. Do you think that was moving to the jury? I think that that was key. Um, I think that Johnny Depp holding himself accountable for the flaws that we all saw that was going to be undeniable to anyone who heard any of it, um, you know, knowingly putting all of that on the stand, it was key that he hold himself, held himself accountable to that. And with respect to Amber Heard, I think her biggest mistake was not holding herself accountable, accountable to any of it. Um, it was purely seeing herself as a victim, not seeing her role, even despite the fact that we are hearing recordings that are telling us that she played a part in this. She still called herself the victim. She still said, I did these things because I was a victim. And I think had she not taken that stance, we would have been able to relate to her and have compassion for her in the way that people had for Johnny. Mm. He was very deliberate on the stand. I think it was smart for his lawyers to get him up there as, as often as they could because he was the star of the show, so to speak. And the more he went up, the more he seemed believable because he was very thoughtful with his words. And he was very convincing as someone that was real, whether you believe him or not. It was real. We're all people. We all have problems. You know, it reminds me of the Maya Angelou quote. It's not what you say. It's not what you do. It's how you make me feel. And he may have really related to people uh, when he talked about his flaws in the way he did. But listen, he talked about how difficult it was for him. And Amber Heard on rebuttal did the same thing. How this instance, all these instances of behavior uh, uh, based on her allegations as well as this trial have met in her life. Let's take a listen. Amber, how did Mr. Depp's statements and threats to you that you were discussing, how do those continue to manifest themselves today? In the harassment, in the humiliation, the campaign against me that's echoed every single day on social media and now in front of cameras in this room, Every single day, I have to relive the trauma. My hands shake, I wake up screaming. I, I have to live with the trauma and the damage done to me. My friends have to live with a set of unspoken rules about how to not scare me. Objection hearsay. Yes, sir. Unspoken rules. It's, it's not hearsay. Go ahead. About how to not touch me, 
not to surprise me. My intimate partners have rules about how they can deal with me, how they can touch me. I have rules for doctors and medical professionals I see, gynecologists I see. I live my life with these sets of rules that I have to follow, my friends have to follow for me not to have a panic attack or a triggering event where I relive the trauma. Even if I'm training to do my movie, for instance, if I'm training for Aquaman, a combat scene and a trigger happens, I have a meltdown and have to deal with that. The, the, the crew I work with have to deal with that because of the damage I walk around with every single day from what I've lived through, from what I've survived. I'm not sitting in this courtroom snickering. I'm not sitting in this courtroom laughing, smiling, and making snide jokes. I'm not. This is horrible. This is painful. And this is humiliating for any human being to go through. And perhaps it's easy to forget that, but I'm a human being. And even though Johnny promised that I deserve this and promised he'd do this, I don't deserve this. I want to move on. Adam, are you buying it? I mean, part of the testimony in this case is uh, that she contacted people when she went for a TRO and potentially had fake bruising. I mean, this is what came out. Uh, she's the one who wrote the op-ed piece and put her life into the whole public arena, which created this. Um, and now she's talking about these rules that she has and the meltdowns that she has. Isn't it kind of consistent with what Johnny Depp's psychologist was saying about the personality disorder? Not all people with that personality disorder do these kind of things. Did, were you buying that statement? Do you think the jury did? Well, I think the jury didn't like her. You know, wh whether they bought it or not, I think let's start with that, because that's ultimately what the most important thing here is, I think. They didn't like her. I think it put them off by her constantly trying to look at them, and they clearly didn't connect with her, and she was really trying to connect with them. Uh, I think that's very different than do I believe her. I believe that he beat her up probably many times. Uh, I think that he is a better actor. He was much more poised on the stand. He had less to lose, quite honestly. Uh, and he had a much larger public media machine behind him than she did. So they were dealing with different types of harassment, regardless of who was guilty and who was not guilty of the offenses they, they accused each other of. Uh, but in that moment, yeah, you see, like, you see genuine emotion whether or not it's being amped up and presented in an uncomfortable way for a jury to, to watch is, is, is probably what ultimately happened here. But you know, listen, if you ask me if I believe her, yeah, I believe her. I think it was the right result potentially, but I, I still believe her. Hmm. All right. Uh, well, we'll have to see if those jurors start talking about whether or not that's where they came down on whether they believed it or not. All accounts would be that they probably didn't, uh, but reasonable minds certainly can differ. Listen, today is a show, it's like a minestrone. You got a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little about the other. So we're going to come back on the other end and add another ingredient. My, Mariah Carey, lawsuit filed against her. Uh, if you can imagine, for a song that she's had out there for a long time, is very popular. We'll get to it on the other end of the break. Stay with us. I'm Jesse Weber, and you're watching Law and Crime. Grab hold of a legendary DR Field and Brush Mower and put it to the test on your property. Get a DR Field and Brush Mower and get the job done right. Go online to drfieldbrush.com to request your free product catalog. All models are now on sale and free shipping is in effect. Hurry, this offer won't last. Look closely at history in the making. This $50 Buffalo gold piece was the purest gold coin ever struck by the U.S. government. It was the first U.S. coin ever struck using .9999, that's four nines, pure 24 karat gold. Its design was based on the famous Buffalo nickel of 1913 to 38. Wildly popular with investors and collectors, the U.S. government had to stop production because of a shortage of specially made gold blanks. It's no wonder the price of that edition has gone through the roof. Now you can reserve your own tribute to the $50 gold buffalo clad in 14 milligrams of 24 karat gold. 
National Collectors Mint's private non-monetary minting recreates James Earl Frazier's American Buffalo against a mirror-like background on one side, and his iconic Native American Indian head stands out in stunning relief on the other. The final issue price was to be set at $50 per proof, but during our special release, this 24-karat gold-clad masterpiece can be yours for only $9.95. With gold prices up over 500% since 2001, price can only be guaranteed for seven days. Each new 2022 $50 Gold Buffalo Tribute Proof order comes individually numbered with a certificate of authenticity verifying that each piece is clad in 14 milligrams of 24 karat gold, is proof struck, and is based on the famous design of James Earl Frazier's Buffalo Nickel. There is a strict limit of five proofs per caller. Distribution will take place in registration number order. Earliest reservations receive the lowest registration numbers, so you must hurry. Avoid disappointment and future regret. Call now. To order the 2022 $50 Gold Buffalo Tribute Proof, call 1-800-573-3562. That's 1-800-573-3562. There's a strict limit of five proofs per caller. So don't delay. Call 1-800-573-3562. That's 1-800-573-3562. There are stories about art from other cultures and food from other cultures and animals from around the world. Do you know koalas have pouches? Did you know islands are made from volcanoes? It's an event every month that unites us and he's excited to share it with me. Celebrate global cultures and explore the wonders of the world with a Little Passport subscription. A monthly exploration brimming with hands-on activities, science projects, and stories. Learn more at littlepassports.com. Must be 18 years or older to order. Okay, we have another celebrity case to talk about. Mariah Carey, along with Sony Music, is being sued for copyright infringement for her hit, All I Want for Christmas is You. You have to have heard it. It's been going on for 30 years, uh, and it controls the air, radio airways every holiday season. Songwriter Andy Stone is looking for at least $20 million in damages because he wrote a song of the same title five years earlier for Vince Vance and the Valance. Uh, Val I hope I got that ba balance. I never heard it. But anyway, this song also still gets played on Christmas radio. So, guys... Uh, Mitchell, let me go to you. What is this about? Why is this suit being filed, filed within 30 years ago? Why is it within the statute of limitations? Is it going to survive? I want to know why it's being filed now. Um, you know, this is a case that, and then this is a song that was written in the 90s. Um, and there was no attempt to even contact Mariah Carey or her team until 2021. So we got to ask that question. Why? I don't know the the answer to that, but um, you know it's it's very interesting because most uh, copyright infringement uh, lawsuits for songs are brought because there's a similarity in the melody. That's kind of one of the most common things that we see. In this case, there's arguably no similarity in the melody, no similarity in the lyrics, and really the same title, which you know we know that copy titles in general are not protected under copyright laws. They, they are sometimes, there's some, some cases where they are, but in this case, they, it would not qualify. And there are in fact, many other songs with, um, <laughs> with this same title. So it's really interesting. The timing is interesting. The arguments are interesting. I don't think they're strong. Where it's filed is interesting. Um, I think there's so many elements of it that just kind of scream for a frivolous lawsuit. Hmm. Adam, if they get past that, uh, I would imagine right from the beginning, if their procedures in their state allow, there's going to be a motion to dismiss it outright for failure to state a claim. You know, we'll wait to see if that happens. But is it your opinion, being the transactional people that lawyers can be at a certain point in time, that the lawyers turn around and say, look, we're looking for nuisance money here. Uh, it's going to cost you all this money to litigate. Let's just let's tie this thing up and, and go away and hope he puts a couple of, a couple of dollars in his pocket. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. That could be uh, their hope, but that's like a stupid hope, right? It's, a, it's much like this lawsuit because Mariah Carey probably has a lot more resources and a lot better lawyers than what's his name, whose name I've already forgotten. Uh, and so I don't know why she would try to give him a bone on any of this versus fight it tooth and nail because it's ridiculous. 
Uh, even though, Mitra, I didn't like the tone she put on when saying the 90s. It wasn't that long ago, but it was uh, a bit ago. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you've, had, <laughs> you've had 28 years or whatever to file this lawsuit. If you felt aggrieved by this, this isn't the first year it's been popular, obviously. My wife will let me know every year when it's time to start playing that song, and then I hear it everywhere I go. It's fine. I love Christmas music, and I love the song. But he's clearly had plenty of time, clearly had plenty of opportunity. There's, n I mean, it, no melody, no lyrics the same, a song title which doesn't seem protected. I wouldn't give a dime of nuisance money to this, and I would I would spend millions fighting it just to prove a point. I've got 15 seconds, Mitra, if you could tell me. No statement yet from her, uh, and maybe she just doesn't want to get mixed up in this and let this add fuel to the fire. Give me 10 seconds of whether you think that it's just ready to part ways and, and get it over with. Listen, if Led Zeppelin won the Stairway to Heaven uh, lawsuit, then... <laughs> she could very easily file a motion to dismiss and win this lawsuit. So I think she's going to stay quiet on it and let let her lawyers do their thing and, and slap this down. Yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're the big when you're the big shot, you got to worry about getting, you know, on the ground with the dog because you may catch the fleas, as they say. We'll see what happens, but I'm sure the lawyers will be responding to it. Mitra, I know you got to go. I greatly appreciate your commentary. We're going to be back on the other end, so please stay with us. Do you find yourself buried in paper? This is the end. The end of paper. The Epson Rapid Receipt Smart Organizer easily scans all your documents. Paper goes in and stress goes away. It's the only solution on the market specifically designed to extract and digitize key data trapped on receipts and invoices. And it integrates with financial software like QuickBooks and TurboTax. Transform paper documents like contracts, tax records, warranties, wills, even recipes into searchable PDFs. So the information is always right at your fingertips, safe and secure. With this exclusive TV offer, you'll get over $300 in added value, including a robust time-saving software bundle, plus get free shipping and a money-back guarantee. Act now and save up to $100 for a limited time. People everywhere love the Epson Rapid Receipt Smart Organizer. When tax time rolls around, my clients need me to be ready. This smart organizer allows me to digitize my clients' tax documents, invoices, and financial records. There's even a mobile rapid receipt you can use when you're on the go. It's like a secret superpower. I use it to digitize receipts from my expense reports at my home office and on site. And back at the main office, I use the desktop scanner for large closing documents and client contracts. They go straight to PDFs, so I can get signatures and share digitally. Oh, it's wonderful. I can organize important paperwork and even save my kids' artwork. So it's safe and secure, easy to share with the whole family. Hey, yeah, let's go. With this exclusive TV offer, you'll get over $300 in added value, including a robust time-saving software bundle, plus get free shipping and a money-back guarantee. Act now and save up to $100 for a limited time. Go online or call to get an Epson Rapid Receipt Smart Organizer delivered right to your door. Epson Rapid Receipt. Visit buyrapidreceipt.com or call. Piece of cake, baby. The Washington Post wrote, Text neck is wrecking your spine with back aches, shoulder strain, and neck pain. Don't you remember your mother always said, Sit up straight. Well, now you can stand straight and feel great with Hempana Straight 8, the new training tool that helps you stand taller, widen your shoulders, and align your spine for instant relief, all while helping to reduce pain from slouching. From the first second you slip it on, your posture will start shifting. The secret is Straight 8's 8 points of support that engage your lower back, mid-back, shoulders, and neck, working together for perfect alignment, building muscle memory that will teach you to stand up straight for years to come. I stand taller, it pulls in my gut, it makes me look more fit. People ask me if I've lost weight. It's all from Straight 8. Straight 8 is ultra comfortable, enriched with moisture wicking hemp fibers, so you can wear it all day without sweating. It easily adjusts from large burly men to petite women. It's so lightweight and discreet that you can wear it under your clothes and nobody will know you have it on. Perfect for support on the job, in the car, and it could help you from bending over your computer all day. Just look at the difference. Countless studies show how slouching makes you look unattractive and lack 
lacking confidence. That's why you need Straight Eight, so you can start standing taller with more confidence, all while helping to reduce the pain in your back and neck. Bulky braces can cost over $100, but order now to get your Straight Eight for only $19.99, and we'll ship it fast and free. Act now, and you can double the offer. Plus, get a jar of our Hempana Pain Cream for hours of pain relief. Just pay a separate fee. And only Straight Eight comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This offer is not available on Amazon. Order right now to get your straight eight with absolutely free shipping. Call 1-800-854-9734. That's 1-800-854-9734 or visit at straight8.com. So call 1-800-854-9734 now. I'm Brian Buckmeyer and you're watching Law and Crime. Hi, welcome back to the afternoon session. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be taking it to 5 o'clock today. So I want to let you know about some of the other things that are going to be going on this week. we got a lot on the plate. Jury selection is underway in Orange County, Florida, for the trial of Danielle Redlick. She is charged with second-degree murder with a weapon and tampering with physical evidence in the 2019 death of her husband, Michael Redlick. Redlick called 911 and said her husband had a heart attack, but when emergency response Response personnel arrived at the scene, she told them that he stabbed himself after they had an altercation. However, the stab wounds were not consistent with self-inflicted stabbing, according to the autopsy that was done. She faces life without parole if convicted. 25 jurors made it through the media exposure round and will be back tomorrow along with 50 new panelists. And in Jacksonville, Florida, jury selection is also underway in the death penalty phase retrial of Alan Wade and Michael Jackson. Both defendants were previously convicted of first-degree murder, kidnapping and robbery of James and Carol Sumner. The retired couple were buried alive back in 2005. They were both sentenced to death. However, that was thrown out after the state legislature passed a law in 2017 that required a unanimous jury verdict in the death penalty phase of the case in which this, these two defendants were not a unanimous verdict. But right now, let's continue looking back at the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial. So we are going to look at something from Whitney Henriquez Amber Heard's sister who posted on Instagram for the first time since this trial started. We'll share that post in a second, but let's look back at her testimony when she was testifying on behalf of her sister Amber about Depp's overall behavior with her sister. What, if any, behavior changes did you observe when Mr. Depp had been drinking alcohol or using drugs? Um, like I said, it was, you know, a completely different version, you know. He was almost unrecognizable when he was drinking and using to an excess. If it was alcohol and Coke, he would, he would slur, he would go on these paranoid, delusional rants about things that didn't make any sense. He, you know, uh, his speech would be slurred. I almost never knew him to use cocaine without drinking. Those were generally combined. Um, when he would smoke weed, he was much more relaxed. He was kind of what you would expect, happy on a couch, laughing. But when he was drinking, he would just get very angry and he would just say really nasty, unkind things. And it almost didn't, usually about Amber, sometimes about me, but it almost didn't matter if she was in the room or not. He would just say really horrible, horrible, horrible things about her or to her. Can you give the jury an, a few examples that you can recall? Pardon my language. <laughs> he called her a used up trash bag. Uh, slimy whore, saggy whore, uh, just, you know, was thrown out a bunch, um, just horrible things like that. Well, as you can imagine, Johnny Depp testified about the relationship between Amber and her sister Whitney, who we just saw on the witness stand right now, and said, no, 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 no. Amber Heard was actually abusive to her sister, testifying about an instance in which Amber threw wine in Whitney's face. Let's take a listen. And how do you know that? Well, I witnessed quite a lot of it. Um, the wine in the face uh, was something that happened in New York, which uh, 
I think that even made it into the papers. I believe that even made it into the papers. It was in an elevator. How did you first learn about that incident? I'm sorry, told me. In detail. What else did you observe of um, Miss Hurd and her sister Whitney's interactions during your relationship with Miss Hurd? They were just constantly up and down, but I, you know, I could, I could sense, I could feel that Whitney was trying to please her sister, trying to be up to snuff, and um, it just seemed like she got shot down. Jackson, every Your time. Honor, it's gone beyond the scope of the question or uh, his oh. foundation for knowledge of that. Your Honor, I, I, I asked what he observed, you know, between them. I think this is responsive to that. And his testimony as to what Whitney felt is... I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Okay. Okay, so keeping all this in mind, here's part of what Whitney Henriquez posted on Instagram. I still stand with you, sissy, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I will always be proud of you for standing up for yourself, for testifying both here in Virginia and in the UK, and for being the voice of so many who can't speak to the things that happen behind closed doors. So uh, this is definitely something that uh, many other things that she puts in this very, very long Instagram post. So let me go to uh, my guests right now. Uh, we have uh, Adam Conta that's still with us, a criminal defense lawyer, and Nicole DeBoard, who is a criminal defense lawyer and former prosecutor. Uh, the statement was rather lengthy on Instagram. Uh, Nicole, let me, let me go to you first. Uh, why? I mean, you know, the, the whole argument was that we didn't want to relive this trauma, and I understand that there's been a verdict going on, but it seems like they want to still relitigate the case, and this is more about the court of public opinion than it is about um, the rights of people who are the victims of domestic abuse. Absolutely. I mean, anytime you've moved over to social media to continue talking about this trial as one of the witnesses or participants in the trial, you're, you're still seeking attention, in my opinion. And uh, it, it appears that Amber Heard really can't get enough attention, and her sister posting about it um, is just one more piece of that, uh, and, and even making statements that are very broad this time, uh, but still definitely directed to the conduct, uh, could potentially be problematic for them in the future. Yeah, Adam, what do you think about this? I mean, are these ill-advised statements, or do you believe that they are working uh, perhaps with a public relations team. We know that Amber fired her public relations people in the middle of the trial, got new ones, and they're just trying to counter the message out there because, it, at least from where I see it, when you look anywhere in any of the social media platforms, uh, Johnny Depp is clearly, without any question, uh, decimating Amber Heard in that court of public opinion. Right. So why aren't we talking about that instead? Why can't it be a third option? that she's just a sister who saw her sister go through something horrible and is saying something genuine, that she's still going to support her sister and she's proud of her. Why can't it just be that simple? I don't think it's some shady, shameless plot for attention that she should be careful that she needs to be worried about litigation or herself. What is she saying here? She's saying she's proud of her sister and that she's still going to stand by her. Johnny Depp released a statement afterwards, a very lengthy statement, taking her to task, and, and he should have. He just won the trial. But when you, I mean, you, you just said it yourself, right? The court of public opinion is not split on this. The court of meme opinion and Instagram and TikTok and Twitter opinion is even more biased towards Johnny Depp. Now, whether they should or shouldn't be, I, you know, I, I've said what I, I think about that, but it's clear that the public has decided this case regardless of evidence and facts. Uh, there are... There are so many voices out there to pinpoint this Instagram post, which only really says, I support you and I love you and I'll continue to do those things. And to try to make it seem nefarious, I, you know, to me, it's just uh, it's just a sister, guys. Just uh, a I, sister. I, I don't think Adam, I, I, certainly I didn't mean to indicate it's nefarious. I, what I'm saying is that there is a meaning and motive attached to it. Do you do you genuinely believe the sister put that out there without consulting Amber and her public relations team? I think it's certainly possible if Amber Heard had put it out there, I think that would be one thing. But, you know, how many layers away do we get before we attribute every statement said 
to a carefully prepared uh, presentation for the public versus just what most of us do is we post on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok when we're on the bathroom, on the subway, doing whatever else. I mean, this is obviously a more thought out statement, but I, I mean, if she had a really successful public relations team, then they would have prepared her to testify much better and she wouldn't have acted the way she did on the stand, right? So I don't think we we need to look too far into her public relations team and their and their success rate. Right well, now. well, we, we all know, Adam, I, I love that commentary, it's beautiful, but we all know, and we've all been there, that you have witnesses sometimes that no matter how much you prep them, and no matter how sure. much you tell them, they are who they be, and they're gonna get up there, especially under the pressure, I'm curious what you think about this, Nicole, and no matter how much you tell them, like I'm sure somebody said, you know, look, when you ask a question, you know, turn and look at the jury and answer. I never do that personally. I want the person to be relaxed. I want them to be natural. I want the convers I want to be conversational. And, and yet I, I have had cases where I, I, the witness, my client, who I have prepped or whatever, says something and I'm just like, you've got, like the beads start to sweat down the side of your head. Like, what are you talking about? What are your thoughts about all this? Oh, totally. I, I have to agree. I mean, anytime a client takes the stand or a witness in your case takes the stand, you're, you know, generally sweating bullets, wondering, you know, what is about to happen up there and will it be anything like what you've heard in preparation or in the retelling and accounting of the story as it as was relayed to you. Um, but I'll say this, too, about that Instagram post. I mean, absolutely, in my opinion, this was done as an attention-grabbing mechanism because clearly this is Amber Heard's sister. And she certainly has methods of communicating with her own sister that are not in the public eye. She could text her. She could call her. She could send her an email. Um, she could go over and see her in person. These are all ways that she can convey the same message to her sister without making it a public spectacle. Yeah, and, so to me, this was on purpose. Yeah, and, and let's be clear. She also put a hashtag, I support Amber Heard, to it. But to Adam's point, too, it could be a sister trying to support her her sister. So, I mean, again, not necessarily quote unquote nefarious, whether it's wise to do or not, uh, reasonable minds, I guess, can debate. But let's not talk, forget about the reason why Whitney was brought onto the witness stand in the first place uh, and about this incident, the staircase incident that became a really, really big issue, uh, both substantively but then evidentially uh, with regard to the incident on the staircase. Let's take a listen. But I'm, I'm standing up there talking, or I'm standing up there, I'm at the top of the stairs with my back to the stairs. And that's when Johnny runs up the stairs. And my again, I'm facing Amber. He comes up behind me, strikes me in the back, kind of just somewhere over here. He strikes me in the back. I hear Amber shout, don't hit my f***ing sister. She smacks him, lands one. And then he grabs, at that point, that's when Travis runs up the stairs after Amber landed one. And But by that time, Johnny had already grabbed Amber by the hair with one hand and was whacking her repeatedly in the face with the other as I was standing there. Travis pulls them apart. I get Amber into mine. I close the doors behind me and lock them. I then hear Johnny's voice <coughs> shouting. Oh, oh. Never mind, what John? Okay, sorry. I hear Johnny's voice shouting, you f***ing hate you. I hate you both, you f***ing you f***ing whores and I hear crashing. I hear crashing and banging and smashing and he starts screaming like an animal. And I then just moved Amber into the next room and I just kept her there all night. Sister, um, all of a sudden put herself in between Johnny and I. Uh, she just threw herself like in the line of fire or whatever, she just, all of a sudden was there and was trying to get Johnny to stop. Um, her back was to the staircase and Johnny swings at her and I just see my little sister with her back on, face, her back to the staircase and Johnny swings at her and I don't even wait, don't even wait for any other, I don't hesitate, I don't wait, I just, in my head, instantly think of Kate Moss and the stairs, and I swung at him. 
Adam, Kanta, Adam, Adam, Adam. I mean, come on. This is kind of like what we were talking about before. I don't know if this is bad. Witness preparation, bad lawyering or whatever. But between those two things and bringing up the name Kate Moss, you saw the lawyers for Johnny Depp's team like high-fiving each other like, oh my God. I mean, we've had this happen in court. You opened the door to the very testimony you tried to exclude what ultimately led to Kate Moss getting on the witness stand for Johnny Johnny Depp, how uh, damning one was it, and where was the error? Was it in the lawyering or in the client? Oh, boy, it could have been both. Uh, I would like to give the lawyer the benefit of the doubt, doubt and say it was the client. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's happened to all of us. You fight vigorously to keep something out that you think could damage your case, and then someone's a little too smart for their own good and opens the door, and there you are. You're stuck with it. Um, you would like to think that the lawyer would have prepared for that, but at the same time, that's kind of a bright line, right? No matter what, no matter what, don't say X, Y, Z. No matter what, don't bring up a staircase or Kate Moss or whatever else. Even if you think it's true, even if you think he pushed Kate Moss down the stairs, we know that she's not going to say that, and that's not going to help us. You know, it, it, you know, it almost doesn't matter. You know what the testimony is going to be if it comes out. And so uh, it was a devastating, devastating moment. For sure. Nicole, I mean, obviously, you know, as a lawyer, like Adam indicates, you know, if, if something's been ruled that it's not admissible, you could certainly tell a client, don't get into this area because it's been ruled inadmissible. Uh, but it is part of her story. Let's, let's accept it for being the truth. Let's say that that is what went through her head when this incident happened. And obviously, lawyers can't suborn perjury. Do you think they put her on that stand knowing she was going to go there? Or do you think they were shocked, her lawyers? You know, I'm going to have to go with they were shocked just because that would just be so completely unprepared uh, to have her do that on purpose because they would have to know uh, the deluge of terrible evidence that would follow if they did that on purpose. Yeah, wow, it, it, it's something else. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back with more of the Johnny Depp case and some other interesting developments that have occurred after the trial on the other end of the break. Please stay with us. It's important to surround yourself with the right people. I've got my workout squad, my brunch squad, and my favorite, my saving squad. They find me the best deals, so I'm not stuck paying for anything that I don't have to. That's why I'm all about CarShield. If your car is out of warranty, you've got to call CarShield today. Because when your car breaks down, you're the one left holding the bill. CarShield administrators help get those repairs paid. That's straight up savings on car repairs. So pick up the phone and call CarShield before your car breaks down. Darlings, this is very important. Call before your car breaks down. Let's keep it real. We rely on mechanics with extensive knowledge and experience to fix our cars. I trust CarShield with my baby, and you should too. CarShield has plans that include protection on major parts and systems like the engine, transmission, entertainment system, air conditioning, electronics, and more. CarShield administrators go the extra mile by including car rental options. You also get emergency services for flat or damaged tires, lockouts, dead batteries, and courtesy towing all at no additional cost to you. That means the price you pay today is the price you'll pay for as long as you cover your car. Darlings, saving on expensive car repairs is just a phone call away. For me, it's a no-brainer. CarShield is America's best value. Join my saving squad and call CarShield so a real protection expert can help you save on car repairs. You need to call CarShield. Matter of fact, you need to call right now. Protect yourself from the unprecedented rise in costs for parts and repairs. Call now to save money with your price lock guarantees at 800-467-6521. 800-467-6521. 800-467-6521. Hi, folks. Medicare Part C plans with extra benefits like getting money added back to your Social Security check may now be available to you in your zip code. Make sure you're not missing out. It's simple. One, call the number on your screen. Two, they'll look up your zip code and see if you're eligible. 
three, they'll check for plans with extra benefits like prescriptions, dental coverage, and the benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every single month. Call now. I call to get everything I deserve. I call to check my zip code for a plan with a benefit that adds money back to my Social Security check. I call to check my zip code. Millions of people have called the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Call. Check your zip code, see if you're eligible, and get what you deserve. Call now. Call 1-800-256-1761. That's 1-800-256-1761 now. I'm Jesse Weber, and you're watching Law and Crime. All right, welcome back to the afternoon session. So Amber Heard did eke out a little bit of a victory, having sued for $100 million for three statements that were made. The jury did come back and find that one statement was, in fact, defamatory. Here is the statement that Amber Heard won on, and it relates to Adam Waldman, who's the attorney that gave uh, a, a statement on April 27, 2020, online, on the online edition of the Daily Mail. This involved the 2016 Penthouse incident. As you can see, we have up on the screen, quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops, but the first attempt didn't do the trick. The officers came to the penthouses, thoroughly searched and interviewed and, after, and left after seeing no damage to face or property. So Amber and her friends spilled a little wine, roughed up the place, uh, got their story straight under the direction of a lawyer and publicist, and then placed a second call to 911. Let's listen to a little bit about Amber Heard when she testified about that encounter when the police responded based on that 911 call. And what, if anything, did you say about the identity of Mr. Depp? Nothing. Were you asked? Yes. But you refused to tell them? Objection leading. Sustained. Okay. Uh, why did you refuse to tell the police officers Mr. Depp's identity? Because I did not want them to arrest Johnny. I did not want this to happen. I did not want any of this to happen. I didn't want to get him in trouble. So I said, well, I, can't. I, I just refused to cooperate. Okay. Now, after, how, approximately how long were the police officers there? I don't recall exactly, maybe, um, I'd say less than half an hour. I, I really don't know exactly, but they weren't there very long at all. Okay. Now, after the police officers left, what did you do? Um, we cleaned up a bit uh, because there was broken glass and we had dogs. So we tried to clean up the, the mess and especially the glass and um, Josh, Rocky, Liz, and I, we kind of just cleaned up and eventually um, sat on the couch and they just tried to comfort me. So, Nicole, there was that one verdict where they found in favor of Amber Heard for the statement made by Johnny Depp's attorney, a $2 million judgment. Interestingly, no punitive damages associated with that. Um, what part of that do you think that the jury found? that? Waldman had made the comment that they threw wine around and messed it up in order to kind of implicate him the next time around. Do you think that's where the jury went? I think, you know, it's really impossible to know exactly what they thought was not true about that statement. Um, and it's interesting to me, too, because it's possible that maybe all of the jurors didn't necessarily agree on exactly what portion of that statement was allegedly false and done with malice. Um, it's interesting, too, as you pointed out, that there are no punitive damages, because even if they believed it to be false and with malice, they certainly didn't feel that the lawyer or Johnny Depp should be punished for the statement. Um, so that is indeed an interesting finding. 
Yeah, Adam, do you make any uh, connection to the fact that they awarded Johnny Depp a $5 million punitive judgment? Of course, under operation of law, that gets reduced to $350,000 in Virginia. But nevertheless, were they kind of making a statement? Because, you know, for Depp to win, he's got to win by clear and convincing evidence, which is just below reasonable doubt. And then with it being a public figure, he's got to show actual malice. So I look at that as like a really, really high bar that he met on all three counts and then they were punitive damages. You make anything out of that? Yeah, I mean, I think the jury just bought into the idea that Johnny Depp's career was essentially destroyed by all this and was done so. If they believe that she defamed him, then that is done. That that cause and effect is sort of foreseeable. And so that's real malice. You're taking away millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars from one of the biggest stars in the world versus his attorney which even if you believe that he didn't say something that was true, the cause and effect of it is really just saying, well, I don't believe what she said. Not that she had, not just she had done something uh, or that he had done something that would have also then required these sort of punishment funds that Johnny, that they thought that Johnny would have uh, deserved. Yeah, Nicole, I, I've got about a minute left. Any any thoughts on collectability on a judgment like this? And where can you explain to our audience how this all works out down the road and how long it can take? And a little bit about pre and post judgment interest, if you don't mind. Sure. I mean, it, it's going to take a long time for this to even be in a place where they can start collecting on either of these judgments. Um, and depending on the circumstance, there could potentially be interest which starts from the time that the judgment becomes final however that's not likely to occur until after all of the appeals in this case are finished which uh, we say exhausted so it's going to be a very long time uh, for any of these judgments to be in collection status if they are ever collected at all yeah and essentially you know we're, we're just waiting to see how the appeals shake out yeah, it's going to be interesting, too. There's so many permutations about collecting a judgment like this at the end of the day. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I'm Terry Austin, and you're watching Law & Crime. Attention, Medicare recipients. The Enogen One Portable Oxygen Concentrator may now be available at little or no cost to you. Call 800-418-9366 to order yours today. Indigen oxygen concentrators are portable and make oxygen from the air around you. They're light, quiet, and battery operated to go everywhere you go. And we have a full line of portable oxygen units to fit a wide range of budgets. If you're on Medicare, you may even qualify to get your Indigen unit at little or no cost to you. Go back to joining friends for the breakfast special, make spending time with the grandkids easier, or start attending your religious services again. Call Indigen now for a free information kit and a free no-obligation consultation on our complete line of affordable portable oxygen products. And anyone on Medicare or with eligible insurance plans may qualify to get an Indigen One at little or no cost. Call 800-418-9366. That's 800-418-9366. Guys, if you're suffering from erectile dysfunction, Peak Performance for Men has a natural solution that can help you today. That's right, stop wasting money on pills and inferior technology that hurts and just masks your ED. Fix it for good. The best part, our ED treatment is non-invasive, painless, and you can get back to your natural function after just a few short in-office sessions. Call us today and mention this ad and your initial consultation is free. We are your trusted specialist and only national erectile dysfunction provider. Call Peak Performance for Men today. There are stories about art from other cultures and food from other cultures and animals from around the world. Do you know koalas have pouches? Did you know islands are made from volcanoes? It's an event every month that unites us and he's excited to share it with me. Celebrate global cultures and explore the wonders of the world with a Little Passport subscription. A monthly exploration brimming with hands-on activities, science projects, and stories. Learn more at littlepassports.com. Must be 18 years or older to order. The world's gone wild over bucket hats. How do you improve on the must-have headwear everybody wants? With breakthrough cooling technology. Mission is the leader in cooling and heat Relief Innovations, now engineered into a full line of stylish and versatile bucket hats. The coolest hat you'll ever wear. On the outside, UPF 50 Performance Fabrics. On the inside, our exclusive hydroactive cooling technology, now with 50% more cooling power. Activate with water, ring, and wave for cooling up to 30 degrees below your body temperature in under 
a minute. It's like your own climate control that goes where you go. Conquering the great outdoors, looking fabulous by the pool, or even better on the town. Hard at work or hard at play. No matter how hot it gets, cool more. Do more with Mission. Machine washable, chemical-free cooling that lasts for hours. Go to Mission.com right now to get your own cooling bucket hat starting as low as $19.99. For a limited time, use the promo code below to save 25% and get free shipping on all Mission cooling and heat relief innovations. With Simplify by Quick it takes just five minutes for me to stay on top of my money. The app tells me when I've been paid, if a bill's too high, or if I've been overspent. I always know how much I have left to spend or save, and that saves me time and money. Start your free trial today. I'm not ready to lose my hair. Not now. But I never thought there was a real solution. Now I use Keeps, the easiest way to keep my hair. And I can get my treatment without leaving the couch. Go to Keeps.com to learn more. These three little sticks are game changers. It is what I call magic in a stick. Boom stick trio. Glow, glimmer, and color. Boom glow. It feels so good on your skin. Boom stick color, blush, your lipstick, and any other color you want. This stuff is super creamy. The boom stick glimmer, it just feels special. It is a nice shimmer. I look like me, but I've got a glow. All right, welcome back to the afternoon session. My name is Bob Bianchi. If you're just joining us, just about two weeks ago, Ryan Duke was found not guilty on all counts in the murder of Georgia beauty queen Tara Grinstead, except the sixth count of concealing her death for which he was found guilty. He was sentenced to the maximum of 10 years in jail for that final count. He's eligible for parole, for parole due to the five years he's already served in custody. Now, he's been indicted in Ben Hill County, the county where he said he helped dispose of Grinstead's body. Uh, again, very fascinating case here. And, and remember that during Ryan Duke's first case, he actually testified. Also keep in mind, he gave a confession to police. Prosecutors argue that only the person who committed the murder could have possibly known the detail that Ryan Dukes told the police. So he got on the witness stand. Let's listen to a little bit of the cross-examination of him in the case in which he was acquitted, actually, for the murder. Then on October 23rd of 2005, you were at the orchard in Ben Hill County, correct? Yes, ma'am. And we can agree that on October 23rd of 2005, Tara Grinstead's dead body was in that same orchard. Yes, ma'am. And we can agree that you saw her dead body, correct? Yes, ma'am. We can agree that you touched her dead body. After I was told to pick the her up. The answer is yes, you touched her dead yes, body. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We can agree that you helped move her dead body. Yes, ma'am. We can agree that you helped Bo Dukes get the pecan wood to be able to burn her body. Yes, ma'am. We can agree that you were in the truck when you drove Tara Grinstead back to the place where she would be burned. I don't know if that's where he continued to burn her or not. I was only there that one time. You were only there that one time. But you were there because you've already admitted you helped put her lifeless body on top of that fire pit. Yes, ma'am, I did. And you don't want to admit to having seen the match struck, but you know that she was set on fire. Yes, ma'am. And you knew that on October 23rd of 2005. Yes, ma'am. And you knew that on October 24th of 2005. Yes, ma'am. And you knew that on October 25th of 2005. And every day after. That's right. Every day after. And you never told a soul. No, ma'am. All right, obviously prosecutors are unsuccessful in the majority of the charges, are the, including the murder case there, but with this new indictment, he is now facing concealing the death of another, hindering the apprehension or punishment of a criminal concealment of facts, two counts of that, two counts also of tampering with evidence. Now, Bo Dukes, who's the other individual that's involved in this case, uh, second trial for similar charges uh, that he is already serving time for starts in Ben Hill County at the end of the month. Uh, so let's listen to John Merchant, who addressed Bo Dukes during the defense's closing argument at the trial. Again, Bo Dukes, Ryan Dukes, basically pointing the fingers at one another in terms of who committed this murder. Let's take a listen. Um, 
thank you so much for your service over the last three weeks. We know what an imposition this has been for you. Um, it's been incredibly hard in your personal lives, I'm sure, and we appreciate uh, your time and attention for taking such good notes. Bo Dukes should be sitting in that chair, not Ryan. Um, Bo Dukes should be on trial for the murder of Tara Grimstead, not Ryan. Where was Bo Dukes in this trial? Why did the state not bring him? Why did we have to call Bo Dukes? Why did Bo Dukes not answer our questions? Be thinking about this as we talk about this case, uh, because there's, there's an important theme here. Ryan took the stand, sat in that chair, and told you what he knew. He told you what happened. He didn't have to do that. He could have, he could have remained silent and sat over there this entire trial uh, and not told you his story. He, he's, and you saw him sit there and tell you that story from his own mouth, with his own words, with his own emotion. And you saw how it affected him when he talked. Don't forget that when the state gets up here and tries to tell you that he's a liar. You saw him. You can tell whether he's telling the truth from that chair or not. Keep that in mind as we go through the evidence in the case, because I think it's very important when we talk about his statement that he gave to the police, which you all have heard a lot about. There are a whole bunch of inconsistencies in that thing. And what did the witness yesterday, Mr. Posey, tell us? It was all over the place. Why was it all over the place? Because he wasn't there. He has no idea what the facts are surrounding her death because he was not there. He told you who was there. Bo Dukes woke him up and said, I killed Tara. Not, I killed Miss Grinstead. I killed Tara. Bo Dukes had her as, uh, Bo Dukes was one of her students. Brian was not. Bo Dukes left that, that trailer that night with Ben McMahon in a black truck at around 10 o'clock at night. Brian was passed out on the floor. You heard from, you heard from Jerry, famous Jerry now, I, I, I assume, uh, picked him up by the belt and dropped him on the floor to make sure he was alive. And he groaned, and that's, how, that's the last time anybody saw Ryan that night. Passed out on the bathroom floor. All right, I still have Adam Conta with me and Nicole DeBoard, uh, both uh, criminal defense lawyers. Uh, Nicole, uh, Adam, let me go to you first on this. Talk to us about this double jeopardy issue. Let's, let's understand what the legal framework is here and how is it that they're being now re-indicted for these additional offenses after there's already been trials on these cases? So you can't be charged and, and prosecuted for something that you've already been charged and prosecuted for, especially on the same evidence. So what they're going to have to do in order to substantiate this indictment, I, I don't know the answer. As I read it and as I look at the articles relating to this new indictment, all my brain is doing is going, this is double jeopardy. This is double jeopardy. So I don't know why it's not yet. But there has to be new evidence. And what they're going to say is that it's based upon his testimony and that it went into more detail in the county in which he's now being charged. And then that's what gives them the cause to now charge him with this new set of charges based on what they're going to say is new information. But it all stems from the same incidents, the same crimes. It's the same set of facts. So I'll be really curious to see if this survives a double jeopardy challenge, which I'm sure will be coming. Yeah, Nicole, I had the misfortune, if you want to look at it from illegally, of trying, working a case like a year and a half ago where I had to look at the double jeopardy laws of each state and they, they were different in terms of, like for example, in New York where, it was very, where double jeopardy is very liberally granted if there's any connective tissue between the matter in which somebody's found guilty or pleads guilty and a crime uh, you know, similar in nature that may have been committed also in the other state. And then some states they do it by common law, some it's statutory law. But what were your, I mean, I think every lawyer that read this at first must have been, it, immediately the issue jumped in that double jeopardy is involved in some way, shape, or form. Do you have any insights into that? I do. And the reality is, is that as long as there are different elements to this crime, right? Uh, so you can have the same set of facts underlying the charges, but what they are charging the person with has a different legal element that needs to be proven. Then they can charge that individual with a different crime based on those facts. So I know that's fairly complicated, but the prosecution may be on firm ground here with these additional charges because they are saying that they have to prove something different than what they had to prove in the murder case. Now, 
if they had to rely on the murder case as an entire fact scenario that they would have to be reproving, they would have a double jeopardy standard uh, a problem, quite frankly. But they don't in this case because they're only having to prove a different crime uh, that he concealed the death of another and did something to tamper with evidence ultimately. So I think that this case will make it all the way through to the finish line. Let me, let me play a, a devil's advocate with you on, on that theory, though. Um, th th this, while he may have testified to that, this is not something that the prosecution was unaware of. Uh, there, there were statements in this case. And I guess I'd like to get to the point, as a former prosecutor, I've never heard the thing where, well, let me, I got him on murder, I got con we got concealment, but you know, let me hold off on tampering, let me hold off on these other charges, see what happens there. If I can't get a conviction on, on number one, I go to indictment number two, and if I can't get a conviction on number two, I go to number three. What responsibility at a certain point in time is there for a prosecutor to bring all the charges relevant to the facts of a particular case in one indictment so it can be adjudicated? It all in all in one space. Right. I, I think that there's definitely an issue there, but that issue is speedy trial as opposed to double jeopardy. And the speedy trial issue is one that requires, in good faith, the prosecution address the issues uh, in, in a time that allows for the defense and the defendant to examine the evidence of the charges against him and go out and talk to witnesses and gather information so that they can defend themselves. And if you lay behind the log and you wait uh, to, to prosecute someone, then the defendant can say, you know, listen, I should not be prosecuted now because I was entitled to a speedy trial on the matter and the case should be dismissed because yeah. the government in bad faith or the state in bad faith did not act when they could have because they knew about these charges. Just yeah. because he confesses to this additional uh, case or these cases on the stand doesn't mean they didn't know about these very things when they were preparing their cross-examination to ask him about these yeah. very crimes. Adam, I'd love to do an analysis around the country of how many motions for a speedy trial are granted by a court, because uh, so far in my entire career of 30 plus years, they, they come out to zero um, and some in pretty egregious situations. I, I guess I may have been doing it wrong when I was prosecutor. Uh, you know, Adam, what do you think? I should have charged for murder. And if there's not a guilty on murder, then I go to ag man and then I go to manslaughter because all those are different elements of the crimes. At a certain point in time, I think this double jeopardy analysis is also going to come to what similarity there are in facts of the case as well. What do you think? I mean, to me, this is bad policy. What you're, what you're arguing to do as the Georgia prosecutors is bad policy. You're saying that you're going to keep trying, trying, trying under a new set of charges with the same set of facts and the same transaction. That's not how our justice system is designed. It's not what it's intended to do. And it's quite frankly an abuse of that system to try to make this some sort of uh, to some sort of normalcy to it. And, and yeah, I get that this is a high profile case. Yeah, I get it. You got you got your, your butt handed to you in trial by a jury. You should have done better. You know, I don't know what else to tell you. You should have prepared better and you should have had better evidence instead of this. To me, this comes off as uh, not a good look for the Georgia prosecution system. Yeah, yeah Nicole, to, to the point that Adam's kind of bringing up there, I mean, we, prosecutors, I'm saying we, we're not judge, jury, and executioner. I mean, there's a reason for a, a multi tiered system here, but I, one cannot help but think, and, and you tell me if you think this is legitimate, because it very well may be, that the prosecutors genuinely believe that he committed this murder. They believe that. They believe an injustice occurred within the court and that the sentence that he got for that one small charge is so woefully inadequate. Is it fair for prosecutors to feel that I need more time, I need more charges it, it consecutively sentence him because an injustice has been done? Or should the prosecutors respect completely the verdict of the jury? You know, I, I these are there are so many questions wrapped up in that one question, and it really comes back down, in my opinion, to these two federal principles, which are you know you have double jeopardy, which is grounded in the federal constitution, as is speedy trial, also grounded in the federal constitution, right? So we have a, a, a Sixth Amendment right uh, to defend ourselves against accusations by the government and to present a defense, and you have the right to do that uh, in the context of a specific allegation. So even though I think that maybe legally from a double jeopardy standpoint, the prosecution may be on firm ground, the reason that I go back to this speedy trial issue, and by the way, I've actually won a case on a speedy trial uh, issue because 
there are times when the prosecution in bad faith can just sort of hide behind the clock and say, I'm not going to proceed on this right now because I think I want to go for the bigger win and not prosecute this person for this smaller case. And now this prosecution team has lost the bigger case and they're trying to go back behind the clock. They have another problem here. And that problem is that they're actually outside the statute of limitations. If you don't count COVID mm. uh, delays, they're outside of these time frames in this circumstance. And there's going to be litigation about whether or not that time bar should prevent them from prosecuting these cases that they now seem to have sour grapes and wish they didn't indict it in the first place. Yeah, interesting how COVID is playing into tolling that statute of limitations in, in some uh, tolling or stopping and then starting again because the courts basically, at least in my state, were like, okay, statutes don't apply from now. They still don't apply. They still don't apply for time against the clock. And then eventually they cut the cord and said, now you can start that clock back up again. Okay, guys, listen, I know both of you are experienced trial lawyers. And, and I personally think that everybody thinks the most powerful and important person in that courtroom is the judge. Um, and, and in many ways it is. But there's also the court stenographer. We're going to talk about what happened in the Johnny Depp case with the court stenographer. Can you imagine it? Now she's in the news and getting beaten up. We'll be right back. I'm Sean Sticks Larkin, and you're watching Law and Crime. With Life Alert, one touch of a button can get you help fast. I'm falling and I can't get up. Don't worry, help is on the way. With any of Life Alert's three emergency systems, help can be summoned immediately, and batteries never need charging. I was having a stroke, and I was scared to death. If it weren't for Life Alert, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Life Alert is a lifesaver. My husband is alive because of Life Alert. Life Alert is the lifesaver to keep me out of assisted living. Life Alert saves a life every 11 minutes. For a free Life Alert brochure, call 1-800-314-4548. That's 1-800-314-4548. Call now, 1-800-314-4548. Roy and Debbie retired, then had to face a volatile market. Worried that their retirement may not last, they contacted their personal capital advisor. They used our free retirement planner, which showed them their chances of retirement success, so that they can make the right decisions about their future and be ready for whatever the market may bring. Get the free retirement planner, then talk to an advisor. Start today at personalcapital.com. This is Mary Ann's first time visiting Paris. Madame, où allez-vous? Uh... Before Mary Ann packed her bags, before she attempted her first sentence in French, before she completed her first 15 minute lesson, yes. she downloaded Babbel. Babbel helped unlock her lifelong dream of learning French. She started speaking in just three weeks. So when it came time to tell the cab driver to take her to the Hotel Pierre... J'aimerais aller à l'Hotel Pierre. Oh, c'est très bien. J'espère votre voyage est bien passé. 150 language experts and educators designed Babbel to be the most efficient and effective way to learn a new language. Babbel focuses on natural conversation. You'll remember what you learn, and you can speak and pronounce with confidence. Start speaking a new language in three weeks. Try it for free at Babbel.com.
When it comes down to the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case, no one gets out of live from scathing criticism, and that includes the beloved court reporter, uh, by all estimations on all sides, Judy Bellinger. Uh, she has been getting a lot of heat because people think she was partying it up with Johnny Depp after the verdict, after the video started circulating that on the internet, uh, but that wasn't the case, okay? So it may appear to be one thing, but it turned out to be another. And if it wasn't, th there you go, you see the video right now, she kind of quickly was with Johnny Depp and is hugging another person there. Um, so she got a rash of criticism on social media. You can see her, she seems like a very, very nice lady. She was always smiling in that courtroom. Uh, but our very own Anjanette Levy, I mean, she was at at the scene commenting, Anjanette was the anchoring, she uh, got a scoop with an interview with the court reporter, with the stenographer, to talk about like what was that all about, what was going on. Let's take a listen to the interview. So after closing arguments, I finally decided I wanted to get out of the courthouse and just take a breather. We were supposed to go until about 5.30, maybe 6, if the jury wanted to. And so I thought, you know, I want to maybe try to go to Indiana this weekend. Let me run down the street and get my oil changed, and I'll come back and go back up. Well, the courthouse closes at a certain time, and I didn't make it back in time. And uh, Judge Ascarati just wanted to close the record. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I'm stuck outside. I'm getting my oil changed. And... Uh, she goes, oh, it's okay. Well, she didn't say it. I was getting uh, messages, and I said, okay, just don't worry. My recording's going. It's it's just closing the record. I'll you know transcribe it when I get back. But then I needed my equipment. So Mr. Chu and it was um, Rebecca. I think they were the ones that were there, and they were kind enough to pack up my computer for me in my backpack, because that's all I needed. I, I leave my machine there, because it's just quicker to come in and just set up my computer and not have to set everything up every day all over. So they were kind enough, they said, okay, if you tell us how to you know, disconnect everything, we'll bring it to you, because we have an office right around the corner from where we are now, and this is where they were staying. And I said, hey, I have an office on Greensboro. I can meet you there and get my equipment, and I can get the transcript out this weekend. So they're like, okay, and then um, I guess Johnny had told them he would really like to meet the court reporter, which was like shocking to me. I'm like, I'm just the court reporter. And so when they brought me my equipment, well, they were gonna bring it and there was no one at our Greensboro office and you can't get in if there's no one there. So and it's Memorial it. Day weekend. Right. So we it's a holiday weekend. Yes. So they just brought it back to the hotel and they said, hey, do you mind if we just take it to the hotel and you can pick it up here? And actually, it took me a minute. I didn't know how to get up here. I didn't know you had to come in the downstairs door and then go to another floor and then get to another floor. It's a little confusing. It is very confusing. And so they had my computer and stuff with them, and they were in the hospitality room, and Johnny was in there. And so I had to go in there and get my equipment, and I saw him, and he's like, he really wants to meet you. And I was in there for probably less than 10 minutes, and he just hugged me and thanked me again, and I had a couple other people there, and I got my equipment, and I came out, and I left and went home. That's really funny, because a lot of people are suggesting you're just out at the after party hanging out you know, with Johnny Depp, and no, that's not what happened. Not at all. I still had a 40, well, from here, I had about a 50-minute drive home, so no, that did not happen. Yes. He gave you a hug. Yes. You picked up your stuff, and you left. Yes. But it was a moment that I'll never forget. And you've got video to yes. support it. Have the grandkids <laughs> seen that video? No, not that I know of. All right, let's make clear what's going on here. She's a freelance reporter. She was actually hired by both sides who paid for her so that they could get daily transcripts. In other words, get them much quicker, which is a great asset when you're on trial. There's a recording machine that's going on that's preserved by the court. So, um, Adam, there, there's a lot of people talking about this. You know, even if she went there because she was starstruck or whatever, there's no insinuation that anything improper occurred. There's a backup record with the, uh, with the recording that the court maintains. Uh, a, a lot of hellabaloo here, or do you see a legitimate issue? Is that social media is an undefeated beast that can and will attack anybody. <laughs> and that goes right back to the Instagram story we were talking about earlier, right? Like, 
What do we? Like, this is a woman who clear, look how giddy and happy she was just to meet Johnny Depp. Aside from whether she should have or shouldn't have been, there's clearly no impropriety here. She clearly is a woman who was hired to do her job and did it well. And there's clearly a backup audio of it. She couldn't have tried to doctor this or do anything with this, uh, with the with the transcript if she tried. It's just everyone is looking to make everyone a villain at the drop of a hat. And this is just another example of that. Yeah, Nicole, you know, court reporters have a very special place in that courtroom. And we've all tried big cases and been there for weeks at a time. And the sheriff's officers or the bailiffs have a role to do, and the judge has a role to do, and the lawyers have a role to do, and the court administrators and the court clerk and the stenographer. You know, after a while, you, you, you know, if you're not a, a jerk, you will be kind of, kind of friendly with one another. Um, and the court reporters, they're important because if you need that or information, they can say yes or no or slow roll it or not. Um, but, you know, what do you think about this whole issue? I think it's outrageous, and, and it is such a shame. This woman was there doing her job at the request of both sides. She's clearly a professional. It would be abnormal for her not to be friendly with either side who she was communicating with. Uh, it does seem like people who are just generally angry individuals looking for someone to blame for their own problems uh, when they're going after someone like a court reporter. Very disappointing. This woman should be applauded for the excellent work that she did in a very long trial. Adam, I got about uh, 20 seconds left. Talk about how difficult their role is, especially when lawyers are talking over one another, rapid fire, cross-examination. This is not an easy job. No, and I'll, I'll say, I'll answer in the reverse real quick. When you have a court reporter who can keep up with you, doesn't interrupt you to ask you to repeat something, and does her job well, she might literally be the most important person in that courtroom, and sh they should be applauded for their work. It's that little magic box. I'll never understand it. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. You look at it, they're, yeah, they read it back word for word. All right, Adam Conta, Nicole DeBoer, thank you guys so much. You did a wonderful job, as always. That's it for me, but don't go anywhere. Stay on the channel. I'll be back this Thursday from 3 to 5. Have a great rest of the week. Buried in receipts, invoices, and other paperwork that's preventing you from doing what matters most? Then get the all-new Epson Rapid Receipt Smart Organizer to scan, digitize, and organize your documents and receipts. Receipts go in, and stress goes away. It's the only solution on the market specifically designed to extract and digitize key data trapped on receipts and invoices. And it integrates with financial software like QuickBooks and TurboTax. Transform paper documents like contracts, tax records, warranties, wills, even recipes into searchable PDFs. So the information is always right at your fingertips, safe and secure. You can even turn business cards into digital contacts. And it scans up to 100 pages at a time, even different sizes in one batch. With this exclusive TV offer, you'll get the Epson Rapid Receipt Smart Organizer and over $300 in added value. Act now and save up to $100 for a limited time. This rapid receipt has made a huge difference. It categorizes everything for me. It puts everything into the right files. I don't misplace a thing anymore. No more losing receipts means no more losing money. People everywhere love the Epson rapid receipt. Organized at last and made so simple. You can use this for both business and household. That's the smartest move I ever made for my business. It even helps organize me for taxes and expenses. There's even a mobile rapid receipt you can use when you're on the go. This has changed everything. As soon as I get a receipt, I just scan it and store it away immediately, right here to the laptop, no matter where I am. With this exclusive TV offer, you'll get a mobile or desktop Epson Rapid Receipt Smart Organizer and over $300 in added value. Act now and save up to $100 for a limited time. Go online or call to get an Epson Rapid Receipt Smart Organizer delivered right to your door. I came, I scanned, I conquered. Epson Rapid Receipt. Visit buyrapidreceipt.com or call. Piece of cake, baby.
This is an important message for everyone on Medicare. Today we are talking about Medicare Part C, commonly called Medicare Advantage. If you don't have a Medicare Part C plan, call now because there may be plans with additional benefits available that are simply not covered under Medicare Parts A and B. That's right, there are people on Medicare but don't have a Medicare Part C plan, which covers everything in Part A and Part B, plus extra benefits in Medicare Part C. Here's the good news. If you're on Medicare, you can call even if you called last year. We will check to see if there is a Part C plan available in your area with additional benefits. If you're losing coverage, moving, or new to Medicare, call to speak with a licensed insurance agent during the special enrollment period. You don't get Medicare Part C benefits automatically, so call now for your free 2022 no-obligation Medicare benefits review. Just call 800-827-1307. 800-827-1307. This is an important message for everyone on Medicare. Today we are talking about Medicare Part C, commonly called Medicare Advantage. If you don't have a Medicare Part C plan, call now because there may be plans with additional benefits available that are simply not covered under Medicare Parts A and B. That's right, there are people on Medicare but don't have a Medicare Part C plan, which covers everything in Part A and Part B, plus extra benefits in Medicare Part C. Here's the good news. If you're on Medicare, you can call even if you called last year. We will check to see if there is a Part C plan available in your area with additional benefits. If you're losing coverage, moving, or new to Medicare, call to speak with a licensed insurance agent during the special enrollment period. You don't get Medicare Part C benefits automatically, so call now for your free 2022 no-obligation Medicare benefits review. Just call 800-827-1307. 800-827-1307. I'm Brian Ross, and you're watching 